Welcome everyone to this episode on our channels. I believe that today's conversation is going to be not only enlightening, but it could be life-saving for some of you who are facing spiritual warfare in your marriage. Help! My spouse has a demon. What do I do if my spouse has an unclean spirit that's tormenting their life? Should I continue to sleep with them? Should I drag them to deliverance? Or should I try to do a deliverance on them? What if they don't want to be delivered? What if they're so deceived and they actually don't think they need deliverance? In fact, they think you're the one that needs deliverance. So we're going to address uh, some of these things today in um, this episode. So, uh, Lana, are you excited Hello, about this everyone. today? Yes, I am really excited. <laughs> I think freedom is the foundation of a good relationship. Absolutely. And those questions that you just mentioned, they are so common that people, you know, concerned and they ask about it. And let's just dive right so many, in. So many times people would come to our prayer lines and they would be convinced that the other person has a demon. Yes. And then during the deliverance, the person that's convinced that it's not them that has a demon ends up being delivered. I remember a particular case, a couple came, a young couple came and her husband was convinced that she needs deliverance and she has demons and when they went through the prayer line, he was the one manifesting and receiving deliverance actually. Not that she probably didn't need deliverance, but he was the one that received deliverance. That was a little bit surprising to all. Yeah. You know, sometimes people blame everything on demons in marriage. I think it's, an, it's Adam and Eve's story where um, Adam blamed his wife and then Eve, you know, she was more spiritual, so she just blamed <laughs> the devil. She's like, right. you know, the devil made me do it. And so we just have to be very careful. When we talk about deliverance today in marriage, we are not shifting blame yeah. on demons for our character flaws, for our um, conflict. We don't say that every marriage problem is a demon is responsible for it, but there are cases where demons involve and attack and harass and try to destroy marriages. I mean, we've seen it so many times and this is, you don't have to take the demon's word for it, but so many times where demon screams and yells, I'm going to destroy this marriage, I'm going to destroy this spouse, I'm going to cause them pain. But even the Bible tells us that Satan comes to steal, kill and destroy. Yeah, and even in our personal case, uh, for me, there was a spiritual issue that started to happen right after we got married. I started to be tormented mm -hmm. uh, by the devil with nightmares and so many other things. So there was this spiritual side of that that I had to receive freedom from the Holy Spirit before our relationship was able to flourish mm -hmm. and go forward. Yeah, I've experienced a level of freedom. Um, I'm not saying that I experienced all of the freedom in every area of my life, but in the area of purity before I mar got married. But I'm thinking if I would have drag that into the marriage, um, you know, uh, both of our demons would create a bigger problem. I think the bigger problem in marriages is when both people have demons and um, it's a little bit easier when one person is delivered and can help the other person, um, at least to walk in the journey of freedom and deliverance. But in your case, like there was no signs or anything of some kind of a demonic attack prior to getting married. It's, it's like that generational curse was yeah. activated yes. after marriage. But sometimes they say that when I was studying in psychology, um, I was taking the class and they said that you can have different things lying dormant right. in your life and then a stress, acute stress triggers it. So it's like even the psychologists, they say that. But we understand in the spiritual realm as well, there, there are different things lying dormant in our life and the change of scenery Yes, a change of location, circumstances. circumstances, a shift in their life causes something to almost like that was dormant there, these generational rejections, nightmares to get quickened out of nowhere. A person doesn't know why am I being tormented out of nowhere, but it's like a generational curse and that needed to be dealt That's exactly what happened to me because the devil is so evil, he rides and takes advantage of the weakest points mm -hmm. of people's lives and circumstances and he will attack. And that's what happened to me when I got married to you. You know, I was from another city. Mm -hmm. We had a brand new relationship, brand new marriage, uh, brand new city, no family, no friends, brand new church that was very small. And the, there was, you know, quite a few 
issues there too and all of that combined it, it it just took me down emotionally and the devil took advantage of that and I feel like some generational curses they were kind of brought alive you know mm -hmm. triggered and I started to have literally demonic attacks uh, during the night and during the day sometimes too. If somebody will say to you, well, you know, these are just normal emotional things, they were not demonic, you, you, you're referring to this as a demonic, was that just part of maybe loneliness? What, what makes you think it was demonic? So it did not start as demonic. Like I said, the circumstances in my life, they were, um, the circumstances that can, you know, affect a person's emotional state. Like I started to experience depression at first because I didn't have my family around. I didn't have friends, new church. I had to get used to and readjust myself and my life to everything new. So that that's not demonic. That's normal. Person can go through the, uh, you know, times like that. But when the devil takes advantage of these things, and I allowed that through certain, um, you know, maybe emotions that I started to experience, like hatred towards people and uh, some of the jealousy, abnormal jealousy even towards Vlad sometimes. And then on the top of that, going further, I started to experience demonic nightmares. And it was not just nightmares. It would be nightmares that I would scream at night and Vlad would have to wake me up mm -hmm. because I was screaming in torment. And those, uh, those nightmares, they would affect my day the next morning and our relationship as well with Vlad. And so other times I would literally feel like the heaviness, darkness, and like something dark is sitting on me, on my shoulders and it would come on me and then kind of like let me go come on me especially when i was at church at the prayer i was feeling terrible like i wasn't feeling myself and so that's how i know it was absolutely demonic feelings on, of loneliness and i started to notice certain things that my um, that ran in my family emotionally wise started to affect me as well. And that's how I knew it was generational. And then the Lord brought freedom. Yes. You know, but I think before God brought freedom, He also had to kind of develop me as a person. I had to change certain perspectives. And so today we're going to address some of those things pretty much to help people who are going through that. Um, but I want to start from the get-go. I don't believe that if your spouse has a demon and you have physical sexual relationship with them that you get the demon that is not um there is no scriptural reference and and, and um of that and every deliverance minister that i know of um would also agree to that statement because sometimes i've heard even people say well you know my spouse has a demon so that's it i'm not going to be sleeping with them anymore because i don't want to contract a demon it's it's not how that works uh, first of all there is a bond of there is a protection that exists there um in marriage uh, and so, and the Bible says that we have to continue to live in a physical relationship as a spouse uh, with each other, not to hold anything back. And the Paul doesn't say unless your spouse, you know, has some spiritual warfare going on. Yeah, and I, I think you would have contracted a demon if you slept with someone that's not your spouse. Yeah, because, you could. Because mm -hmm. you know. Uh, sin is an open door to demons and that's how you could mm -hmm. you know get a demon but not when you have a, a real marriage and relationship in your marriage number one marriage is like a beautiful garden from which we have to pull weeds plant seeds and kill the snakes could you please explain what does it mean so weeds represent bad habits such as poor communication, um, not fighting properly, lack of commitment, using words like always, never, threatening with divorce, raising your voice, uh, seeking not to understand your spouse, but to right away change your spouse. And so these are bad habits, human bad habits, weeds. We got to pull them out. All of us have certain uh, traits we picked up. They're not the scriptural, they're not demonic, but they're just not biblical, worldly. I call them weeds. Uh, seeds are, 
are the good habits, good attitudes and good behaviors toward your spouse. You got to plant them because you can pull out all the weeds. If you don't do anything proactive, if you don't show love to your spouse, if you don't show respect to your spouse, if you don't actively, intentionally pursue your spouse, but you only don't do anything bad, your marriage is not going to thrive and blossom. But sometimes in marriage, there's not only seeds and weeds, there's also snakes. And snakes are the spiritual problems. They are different because you don't pull out the snake. You got to kill the snake. Weeds you pull out, seeds you plant, and then snakes you kill. Now, when it comes to snakes, what are some of the common spiritual problems that people face in marriage? Yes, good question. So I think number one is obviously generational curses, mm -hmm. things that get passed on through the bloodline. And then there's demonic torments such like a s spirit spouses, uh, abnormal anger, control, manipulation, and then strongholds in our minds. There are also uh, like lies, uh, expectations that are not realistic and then addictions to alcohol, pornography, drugs, gambling, whatever that might be. And sometimes they could be demonic, but sometimes they're just simply addictions, bad habits that a person needs rehab, some discipline in their life, and they can break away from them. Yeah. And then uh, character issues like uh, blame shifting, neg neg constant negativity, selfishness, pride, and so on, and also trauma if we don't deal with our past traumas. Mm -hmm. Now, when, as a Christians, we have to understand that in our marriage, we have to attack the problem, attack the snake instead of our spouse. The problem that happens in many marriages who face spiritual warfare is at first we go attacking the spouse instead of attacking the snake and attacking the problem mm -hmm. is what we need to be doing, not attacking the person. We got to deal with the root of the problem. We got to, like Adam didn't do that. Adam should have thrown that snake out of the garden. Instead, he let Eve talk to that snake. You know, and the Bible says that Eve gave this fruit to Adam who was next to her. So if Eve was there with Adam, all Adam had to do is to take that snake and just tell that snake to go or to kick it out of the garden. Adam didn't throw the snake out of the garden. Instead, he did what the snake wanted them and now the snake threw the Adam out of garden. Of course, it wasn't the snake, it was Adam's sin. And so the challenge that happens, we have to be very careful to not to label everything in the marriage as demonic because that's one error is when any problem that's too big, oh, it's just a demon. You know, my husband is a narcissist, it's a demon. My husband is mean, it's a demon. My wife is controlling, everything is a demon. We have to be very careful not to jump to everything is demonic. And the other part is we also have to be very careful that we don't shift blame on people and we leave the devil innocent, meaning he, he's not responsible. Spiritual warfare has nothing to do with it. Demons aren't involved in this. Generational curses aren't involved in this. Um, uh, trauma has nothing to do with this. This fact, the fact the person got abused or some kind of a being sleeps with them uh, in, this, in their sleep and this has nothing to do with it. We just need therapy and counseling. And we need therapy and counseling, but we also need deliverance. But I also remember how in the beginning of our marriage, when I started to struggle with my uh, issues, how it took your maturity to help me as, as your spouse. Mm -hmm. And I remember there were times when we were like fighting each other instead of fighting the problem. <laughs> oh, and yeah. those were the hard days. Mm -hmm. I remember it did not help it didn't help me, it didn't help you, it didn't help anybody. And the problem still remained. Yeah. When we recognized that we have to just spend our energy to fighting for each other, we for have an other. enemy, yeah, mm. and not against each other. This is when things started to move forward towards, uh, you know, my deliverance and your, you know, growth, mm -hmm. both of our growth. It reminds me of scripture in the Bible where God sometimes would send the spirit of confusion against the enemy and they fought each other. 
and God's people just simply walked into a place where victory was assured. It's almost like all the devil has to do is to shift the fight so we don't fight him, but we fight each other, then we destroy each other and we leave him out of the picture. And so I think one of the first steps of spiritual warfare in marriage is when you begin to understand my spouse is, is not the snake. Come on, somebody, <laughs> drop this in the chat. It's good. My spouse is not the snake. I have a snake. His name is Satan, it's demons, it's principalities, powers, it's, it's demonic kingdom. It's not my spouse. Now, my spouse may be collaborating with the snake. <laughs> my spouse might be under the oppression and demonic control of a snake, but they're not the snake. Right. Right. And I think it's very um, hard sometimes when you're in that moment. Mm -hmm. It takes to break your ego and a little bit of step towards maturity to recognize that. It, it's, it's easier because you take it personally. Oh, why is she behaving like this? Why is she feeling like this? But when you start to kind of recognize and kind of pause and think who is the real enemy, that's when the mm -hmm. change comes. Mm -hmm. and so, now, something that we need to address um, is, is this. A lot of times when it comes to helping someone with their deliverance, we need to first take a deep look into our own heart. And what you just mentioned about, in my case, I had to step in maturity first. I like David, when David came to fight against Goliath, but before he fought Goliath, he first won battles with lions. Jesus said, before you go and try to pluck um, a piece of speck out of somebody's eye, pull a log out of your own log, uh, out of your own place. So uh, what we have to understand is that we love fighting Goliaths for our spouse while ignoring lions in our own soul. We blame our private issues on our spouse. And for me, what I had to do is this, not to blame my reaction on your um, warfare, meaning why yeah. I'm fighting you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't blame your trouble for that. I had to take responsibility for my attitude and for my actions. And, and as, as long as I can take responsibility for my actions, what it did is it made me focus on, let me pull this out of my own heart, my, my wrong response, instead of saying, well, you're the one that has demons. You're the one that's not fighting hard enough. You should fast more. You should do this. Because in the beginning, yeah. that was my reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just like telling you, no, you, you, you're, you're more than a conqueror. I threw these scriptures, but honestly, I just didn't care. And I was angry. I was short with you. I was impatient. And I was just also disappointed with the fact that I kind of hope that this marriage is going to not only start well, but this marriage is just going to grow, become better and better. And I, I felt like, I deserved more and this is bad, but I felt like I deserved more and here I am getting slammed with these problems. You know, instead I was hoping to just getting slammed with a lot of joy, <laughs> a lot of sex, a lot of romance and just like, man, that's it. My life is just going to be better. And boom, I got thrown into a battle that I didn't sign up for. And so, you know, I lived my life in purity. I lived yeah. my life in all them. Like this, this is not what I signed up for. I felt like God dealt me a short hand of the stick the, the, in those moments when the war was very painful and then what made it harder is in the church you acted like Lot's wife like a pillar you would frozen chosen like a lot of times when you were under that warfare and I cared more about what people thought yeah. about our marriage but you didn't care about that you cared about the fact that hey we're not doing well and I don't care what people think about it with me my image mattered a lot to me I was like well I know we're not doing good but at least let's pretend to be doing good and for you you just wanted the whole world know that <laughs> almost like I know you didn't intentionally but it's like you didn't care the fact that people will know that you're not doing good I just wanted to hide that and just for you to put on a fake smile and because I learned how to not fake it, but I learned how to compartmentalize my life. Ministry made me to do that. And I'm more, you know, image driven, work driven uh, than, than you are. Yeah. You're just more relationship, relationship driven. So all of these idols, all of these weaknesses, they came to the surface. And I remember I had to choose my image or my wife. Yes. yes. I had to choose whether I'm going to be loving toward you without trying to change you, or I'm going to focus on trying to control you, change you, or um, yeah. And uh, on my side, I felt like my wound was so big mm. that I was not able to help myself. And I felt 
sometimes betrayed that my own husband couldn't give me a hand Ouch. in a sense, but you were giving me this fake Band-Aid. Okay, mm -hmm. just put it on and do it yourself. And to me, that was so, so painful because I felt like paralytic. I couldn't mm -hmm. move. Like mm -hmm. somebody needed to carry me at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I am here in a new city. Like you took responsibility for me. And so we were going kind of like back and forth, you know, feeling sorry for ourselves. And, and both of us, we had legitimate uh, feelings and they were, you know, somewhat justified, but we just did not know how to help each other in a mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Until the time we learned. <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember the Lord kind of showed me, He said, you know, your wife is like a flower. Flowers don't grow if you pull them. They grow if you water them, you know, and not to be the one to try to change your spouse, but to be the one to love your spouse and come alongside and help them to fight this battle. But part of spiritual warfare that sometimes people ignore in marriage is the wounds. Because um, many people, they, they think everything is demonic. And it's true that sometimes a wound, a rejection, abuse, um, really bad experience was not dealt with properly. Mm -hmm. And then it attracted demons. It got infected. And now it's becoming a bigger problem and this person is response back, reacts back. And some people don't have really demons, they just have deep, deep wounds mm -hmm. that they need to be dealt with. And some people have both those wounds and they have demons. And so one of the things that we had to also do, even in your case and, and just even um, generally, when people go through deliverance in their church and they've been through abuse, we encourage them that deliverance doesn't necessarily bring complete freedom in their life if their wounds aren't dealt with. And sometimes we have to go backwards to go forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. You have to go back to heal your wounds. Mm -hmm. Now, something that counselors believe that majority of what drives us as adults happened to us in our early years. Um, somebody said, think of a play and a script being handed to an actor for a certain part. We must examine the script and rewrite it with God. Script in counseling a lot of times refers to the unconscious, learned patterns of thinking, feeling and behaving that individuals develop based on their family dynamics, early family dynamics, upbringing and experience. Now, I want you guys to listen to this. The family of origin, your family of origin, plays a significant role in the development of these scripts that you've been reading to your spouse and to your life. The scripts are written for us long ago and these scripts are faithfully followed and reinforced as we hold them tightly. For example, some people whose parents abandon them, they may live is if they expect those who love them to abandon them. There's always this unsurance, this insecurity because of this hurt and this abuse. Someone said that scripts, they distort our reality and they drive people to act and react what could be destructive in destructive ways. Scripts also help people, scripts impact how people give and receive love. Unresolved physical, emotional and sexual abuse parental divorce, abandonment, failure, emotional loss need to be dealt with before the father so that they don't bring this into the marriage and ruin this marriage. And so can you share just few of the signs of a person who has deep, deep wounds that they actually need healing, not just deliverance? Yeah, so this is the signs. A uh, person never seems to be fixed. No matter how much you love on them, no matter how much you try to help them, there's always something that's wrong and always not fixed. And then portions of memory missing, that's like very, very common. If any trauma is involved, usually this is our kind of like a self-protection mechanism mm -hmm. kick, kick, kicks in and we're blocking that memory. Relationships are difficult and dysfunctional constantly bad decisions, self-abuse, self-harm, behavior usually is involved, and dominant emotional uh, bitterness, self, 
condemnation, false guilt, shame, rejection, abandonment, hatred, and unforgiveness. So if you notice these signs in your life and you can point to a time or a place where you were rejected, abandoned, uh, your family got divorced, or maybe perhaps you were physically, sexually um, taken advantage of. And what you must understand is that time doesn't heal, only Jesus heals. And you must understand is that wounds neglected become infected. You have to deal with those wounds that they turn into scars and then these scars can become your testimony. Even Jesus was wounded. I love these two verses in the Bible, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. It says, The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Maybe you've experienced that broken heart. I want you to notice that after healing of the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. A lot of times, those abuses, those wounds in our most vulnerable, weak moments of our development become actually an entry point for the enemy to flood with anger, to bring us with rage, to bring us lust, to bring us addictions even in our life. We're not blaming the devil. We're not blaming our parents. What we're saying is that we just have to be smart and to deal with those things. It's kind of like this if you're married to a wounded person. Imagine you just had an injury working out. You just completely messed up your back. And then you show up again next day in the gym. You, you, you can't walk even, your back is hurting. And then your trainer tells you, no, work, come on, work out harder. You know, stretch again, lift yeah, that again. Yeah. You know, that will cause the injury you receive to be even worse. It's extremely painful. We have a lot of people today in marriage who are told to try harder when they're injured emotionally. They are broken on the side. Their heart is broken. Jesus said He wants to heal those hearts. He doesn't come and beat those hearts and say, try harder. And then the other part is Isaiah 53 verse 5. It says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we were healed. So Jesus was bruised. He was chastised. By His stripes we were healed. So we can experience healing. We can experience restoration from our past hurt, from our past trauma, and it's important that we deal with that. I'm, I don't believe that we need to constantly go on this hunt and look for it, but as the Holy Spirit brings it up, and sometimes if you keep fixing it, you went through deliverance, and you're not feeling like you're getting the breakthrough that you want, sometimes you need to go to a Christian counselor. They will probe a little bit into your past and they'll bring some things and, and the Lord can bring healing to those yes. things so that we can now be healed and now we can do better because we're whole instead of doing better when we're injured. Absolutely. Now, what are some of the wrong ways that people deal with their trauma, with their abuse that sometimes actually encourages this spiritual warfare and intensifies it. Yeah, yeah. number one is denial. When victim lives in denial and then minimizing, oh, it's not that bad, I, I think I got over it, it wasn't that bad, and then rationalizing the situation, abuse and trauma can never be rationalized or but excuses or making excuses mm -hmm. yes and then disassociating from what happened uh, we go somewhere else mentally mm -hmm. as though it wasn't us like mm -hmm. and um, yeah and the wrong way to deal with pain is uh, we sometimes medi medicated with maybe drugs alcohol and if you see people are uh, medicating if you see people in addiction, most likely it can be connected to the trauma they've experienced in their lifetime. And then another wrong way to deal with pain is to motivate it uh, with busyness, staying busy, almost people that cannot stay in a quiet place, mm -hmm. enjoy peace, enjoy themselves, hearing their own thoughts. And the last one is to medicate it. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the wrong ways that yeah. we can do to um, deal with trauma and with pain, with abuse. And um, this doesn't mean that every person responds to the hurt or difficult thing in their life the same. You know, I remember when I saw my best friend in Ukraine at the age of nine, um, killed right in front of my eyes. 
and it, it was a trauma. Um, nobody really helped me to process that. For a few weeks, I was just completely almost like numb. And um, because of my Christian faith and because of the community, I was able to kind of walk out of this. But I'm thinking, I'm like, man, had it not been for believers and my, be my other best friend who was still alive at the time, who helped me to kind of walk through it. Think of, and this is something that it was an accident that happened, but still it's, it's pretty dramatic. It's still planted in my memory. I still s see that. But it was a brutal scene as well. Yeah, and it's a very brutal. Half of his skull was removed in front of my eyes. It was just, it was just pretty brutal. And so, and you know, but I had few scenes in my life where I was, um, you know, rejected. And, and it's not always how physically painful it was that determined how deeply painful it was for the emotions and for the, for the stuff. And then you experience a lot of that, especially if you experienced it from your father, you experienced it in the absence of your father. A lot of times you grow up and you begin to either medicate it with pornography, you know, you try to motivate it with um, hard work to prove something, you're super driven, don't care about anybody, just want to be successful. Or you meditate, you live in that victimhood, like I'm not good enough, I'll never amount to anything, and you know, look at me, blaming the world. But there's a proper way of dealing with it, and that is we have to face it, we have to face the pain, we have to also forgive the person that caused it, and we have to follow Jesus away from that pain. It will be a process. And lastly, in many cases, we do need to find professional help, uh, both for deliverance mm -hmm. and sometimes even for inner healing or professional help for our soul and for our heart. Just, just think of this, let's say your teeth, your tooth is hurting really bad. You know, you don't necessarily all go to deliverance, you go find a dentist and they, you know, either fix a, a cavity there or pull a, te a tooth or fix a root canal or something. And so we have to think of our emotions in, in, the, in the same similar way. They are part of us that needs fixing and Jesus can come with His power. But sometimes there are people who actually know this area and they can help us to walk through that area. And um, it's important why we are addressing this is because it's a missing component in so many couples who experience deliverance but who don't embrace the process of walking out in their healing. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I think the, the hardest part is to face it because nobody <laughs> wants to go back and relieve the pain, those emotions. But if you would want to be healed, mm -hmm. I think it's crucial to face it. One of them, you said, find a professional help. But the most important thing is the way we face it is with the Holy Spirit. It's fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, allowing the presence of the Holy Spirit to heal you, to heal your wounds, to heal your heart. You don't have to go around and talking to many people about your traumas and mm -hmm. things like that. Please don't do that. Talk to one person. It's the Holy Spirit. He's the number one person who can fully heal you. And also some people need to yeah. speak to a mature believer or a counselor uh, who will help them. The Bible says confess your sins so you can be forgiven. Yeah. The other part that is very important that we wanted to deal with, so not only we have to understand that the spiritual world is real, not all problems in our life are demonic in marriage. We have to understand is that marriage requires seeds, weeds and snakes to be killed. We kill snakes, we pull weeds and then we plant seeds. Uh, we understand that there are spiritual entities at war against the happiness of our marriage and these things could be generational stuff, uh, this, these things could be demons, it could be soul ties that we've um, picked up through previous relationships with other people, it could be words we've spoken over ourselves and said that, you know, um, I'll never have this or I'll never have that or a person that we hurt deeply who pronounced words against us and cursed us. And so there could be word curses that could be pronounced as well. And some people just have a um, demonic attack because they were involved in the occult and an unclean spirit torments them and it affects their life. And so some people started as indulging in the flesh, you know, maybe watching pornography and then they grew into something that um, a demon has gained a foothold in their life and now they're addicted, they can't stop. And uh, we as the, the person on the other side must understand we don't blame this person. We uh, help to battle with them 
um, against the spiritual powers. We must understand sometimes they're broken. Not only they're bound, but they're also broken. Uh, they're bruised and we come alongside and help to battle with them, not against them, and we help to bring them wholeness and healing um, to get on the right path. It's important to be aware not to allow witchcraft in your marriage while you're dealing with warfare. When I say witchcraft is out of impatience, out of anger, out of frustration, out of unmet expectations, that we begin to go into control, um, manipulation, intimidation, and domination. And that's witchcraft. Witchcraft can be a spiritual power, but witchcraft can also be a works of the flesh, as it says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. It could be a work of the flesh, trying to control the other person. Just because we are on the right track and we understand it's a spiritual warfare, it could take longer. And not only it could take longer, but it also could um, require a lot of self-denial, self-control, yes. gentleness, and kindness. It, it's not, and sometimes instead of self-control, the devil offers us a quick way and he says, just control your spouse. Just, you know, instead of humbling yourself and in gentleness dealing with this broken person, we go in into domination. Um, instead of trying to humble ourselves, we go into manipulating. So it's very important that we take care of our own attitude, take care of our own heart. And I, I think the control part of it, it just comes natural to us humans because we are drawn towards the f works of the flesh mm -hmm. automatically. Mm -hmm. But for us to not do that, we, it's, it's work and we have to be focused on, on the Lord and on, you know, having a relationship with mm -hmm. the Lord for us not to be for walking in the spirit, not to fulfill the works of the flesh mm -hmm. and works of the flesh is you know, uh, manipulation, control, control, and all of that, which is very mm -hmm. um, natural. <laughs> but now we wanna, pretty much all this time that we talked, we mainly addressed group of people where the spouse who is bound is repentant. Right. Humble, seeking help. Mm -hmm. So when we talked about up to now, pretty much, we dealt mainly with a spouse that somewhat recognizes they have a problem. And they need help. Want and help. they need help. Mm -hmm. They're seeking to help. They might fall, fail, but they're looking for help. What do you do with a spouse that obviously has demons, obviously is broken, but they not refuse to, repentant, yeah. not um, wanting to get help? And I, I like to use this example is that a repented spouse we help to restore. Rebellious spouse, we release. Could you explain that? So Judas and Peter. Peter, Jesus restored. Judas, he let him go. To his own destruction. Unfortunately. Now, this may sound extremely painful, and I'm gonna, we're gonna explain just a little bit what this means. So this, we're not giving any license to go and release your spouse right now. Let's listen to this very carefully, but um, Judas didn't have a bad day. He had a bad heart. The devil entered Judas, but Judas himself, Jesus called him the devil before the devil entered. Something about the nature of Judas was hard. so messed up never once asking for help, never once repenting. There's no of that. There's no tears of that. I mean, he tried to kind of throw the money back to the Pharisees after he denied Christ. But if you look at Peter, Peter denies Jesus three times. And the Bible says that Satan asked to sift Peter like weed. So Satan was involved in that. We're not saying that Peter had a demon uh, in that case, but there was a demonic intrusion on Peter that kind of he caved under pressure and Jesus restored Peter. He released Judas. I'm thinking about David and Saul. David distanced himself from Saul because Saul didn't just have a demonic attack on his life. Saul had a bad heart mm -hmm. that was not repentant truly to God. Saul was toxic, right. destructive, and he threatened the life of David. Mm -hmm. So how would you know if it's somebody that's just struggling, being demonized, and do you work with them or somebody who is not just struggling anymore, they're actually practicing that sin. They're accepting it as part of their life. They are not repenting at all. They're not seeking any help. 
They are toxic, they're abusive, they're persistently stubborn, they're hard-headed, unrepentant person who refuses to get help. They blame the devil for their actions or somebody else. They threaten your very life or the life of your children. Never take responsibility. They never take responsibility. They are cheating on you all the time. They are physically abusing you. In that case, you have a biblical permission and actually and wisdom to separate from that person, distance yourself from that person so that that person will come to the reality of their own wickedness and will come to the reality and repent, like prodigal son. The father couldn't change the prodigal son. No. He just let him go. He loved him. He was broken over his condition, but he let him go and something happened. Yeah. That pig pen yeah. caused certain brokenness yeah. to happen. And I think sometimes if you're dealing with a spouse, absolutely has no desire to repent. They didn't, they're not having a hard day. They just have a hard heart stubborn and persistent, threatening the very life of you, and yeah. you're enabling that? Yes. By constantly being with them, guess what begins to happen? I think that it's if, not healthy. Yes, even God allows people like that to hit the rock bottom so they can turn to humility and ask God for help. And I think if we are enabling people like that, if you're a spouse, and you're enabling by accepting, always forgiving. Oh, he's, he promised he will change or she will change. And it's been years and you're still enabling and supporting and accepting them into the house. I think that's a big mistake. You're prolonging that rock bottom for a person to turn back, just like prodigal son. And it's hard. Yeah. You know, and sometimes a couple settle for relief. Yeah. Yeah, instead yeah. of Momentary repentance. Momentary relief. Momentary relief, you know, and instead of repentance. And so uh, a person that needs, uh, you know, deliverance is a person that's repentant, confesses, seeks help, is soft-hearted, take res takes responsibility, and doesn't expect the trust to be restored immediately. Right. That person doesn't is going to get, mm -hmm. that person is going to get delivered. Right. But the person that needs to be, we need to distance ourselves from, is the person that's abusive, persistent, stubborn, hard-hearted, yeah. unrepentant. Yeah. Manipulative. Re manipulative, controlling, and, and but another yeah. big thing is that they threaten your life. Yes. Meaning they have these outbursts where they throw stuff and they, they hurt your children. Like with David and Saul, David had to run for his life. He was still yeah. honored Saul. Yes. He even prayed yeah, yeah, probably yeah. for him, but he wept at his funeral. But David is like, I, I can't be close like this. And so um, there is this thing in, in some Christian circles where, you know, a wife is being told, no, you submit to your husband. He beats you physically. No, you submit to him because a wife should submit. He uh, sexually takes advantage abuses you. No, you got to submit to him. You know, he uh, beats children. We're not talking about disciplining or spanking. We're talking about physically beating children. No, yes. you got to submit to him. Um, no, in that case, like we have to call the police. Yeah. We got to report. Yeah. We got to, we got to distance ourselves from this kind of a toxic relationship. I consider this like a Judas situation or like a Saul situation. Sometimes God restores and sometimes God just releases it and saying, you know what, if you're so hard hearted, if you're so stubborn, if you do not want to repent, I'm just going to let it go. So sometimes we're dealing with this um, situation. We have to just discern where we need to distance ourselves, where we need to intentionally seek deliverance. And also in some cases, we don't need to seek deliverance. We just need to seek grow in discipleship. You know, we need to really just um, continue to work with each other and, and get better. And sometimes deliverance and discipleship is the same time. It goes hand, yeah. hand in hand. Yeah, hand in hand, yeah. But yeah. I do, we, we really wanted to emphasize that um, if a, a person absolutely does not want to get help mm -hmm. um, to get delivered, but if the person, let's say, is getting spiritually attacked, but they, they honor you, they respect you, they take care of you, uh, they uh, love you, uh, they're faithful to you, okay? Uh, but let's say that they have a demon. You're convinced they have a demon, you know? Um, don't leave them. <laughs> You know, just continue to be with them, continue to love them and continue to pray Offer for them. Offer a helping hand. Offer a helping hand. Don't, don't try to, uh, don't run away from them. Oh, they have a demon. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. If they take care of you and if they're livable, uh, but they're being tormented um, in there's some way that doesn't f 
affect the livelihood of this relationship, continue to pray for them. May the Lord open their eyes. But sometimes constantly kind of pushing it. I, I've seen sometimes these husbands dragged to deliverance and the wife, you know, the husband even says, my wife told me I have a demon. You know, like, and I'm like, so do you think you have a demon? It's like, no, I just have a crazy wife. <laughs> you know, and so... And um, he still came there. But he still would come out of yeah. respect and he's like, man, just, just pray for me so I can be done with, so she can be convinced that I don't have a demon. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and of course, and I could see the, the guy got really, you know, bullied in that situation and stuff. And so I think there's a right way to do it, to go about it by not necessarily bullying the other spouse, yeah, but yeah, to yeah. Um, encourage them to speak to them as they their understanding uh, is being enlightened. And the moment there's a blockage in their understanding, that we continue to love them and pray for them, that the Lord will yes. work on their heart. And I feel like when it comes to bringing your spouse to deliverance, deliverance can never be pushed on a person. Yeah, You cannot can convince it please, just for me, do it mm -hmm. one more time. That's not how deliverance works. If a person doesn't have a genuine desire and understanding that they need deliverance and that they want it, mm -hmm. most of the times it's not gonna work. So I ask you, please do not drag your spouse, uh, you know, by the hands <laughs> mm -hmm. to go through the deliverance and through the prayer line just because you're convincing them that they need it. But you can lead them to deliverance. You can encourage them toward deliverance. Encouragement is different, yeah, You yes. can pray for them, you can uh, converse with them by dragging it, bullying it, uh, withholding sex uh, or money if punishing, they don't get delivered, or yeah. punishing. And that, that is deliverance. Yeah is for the desperate. You have to yeah. want that. Yeah, yeah, if a yeah. person doesn't want it, don't even think they need deliverance and you're just coming in and fire hosing them. I mean, Jesus, Jesus didn't do that on Judas. He didn't go up and just force deliverance on Judas. That's why sometimes people say, well, this is a proof that Jesus, um, Christians cannot have demons because, uh, you know, look, uh, Judas wasn't delivered or look, Ananias wasn't delivered and Satan, you know, planted in his heart. But deliverance, what people don't understand is deliverance can't be forced, like you said. Deliverance is something that you choose. You cry yeah, out. David would cry out in Psalms, deliver me, yes, Lord. Yes. So you can't force it on somebody. You can pray for them. The same way as salvation. You can't force. Yeah. You can't put a gun to somebody's head and say, you need to get saved. Uh, we, we don't live in those mm -hmm. crusade, dark, dark ages. And so it's not biblical. We pray, we encourage, we share testimonies. Uh, we give them a book. We can take them to a meeting. You know, you can't make a horse drink, but... Um, especially when it comes to your spouse. Yeah. Like you can damage your relationship that you have by, you know, dragging your spouse to deliverance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just not wise. You know, like interesting with our relationship with you. In fact, I actually never prayed for, no, I prayed many times for your, um, for the nightmares, against the nightmares and everything. But when it comes to like making the demon confess and, and all of the stuff, I didn't go that route. I felt like my number one duty was to love you, but we did go when you recognized that it was a spiritual warfare. We did go to a few places and to a few people that prayed for you. But even then, I was there to support and be willing to, if this is my but problem. But it was my desire. Yes. I wanted to be free. I knew that that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't myself. Something was going on and I wanted to be free. And the Holy Spirit set me free. But. The interesting thing is that when I received freedom, I, um, I felt like now I can actually fight for myself in a sense of now I, I have strength to uh, read the Bible, pray, renew my mind, listen to right uh, podcasts and mm -hmm. spend time with the Holy Spirit. Prior to that, it was very difficult for me to do that. Somebody sometimes says that when you're bound, it's like your hands are tied up. Yes. And when you are delivered, it's not that you no longer have a battle. It's that you're delivered for that battle. You're yes. delivered for the yes. battle. Yeah. You are now you have a fighting chance yes, because yes. your your hands are loosed. He trains our our hands for battle and our our, our hands so for yeah. battle and our fingers for war. Something along those lines. And so, pretty much, it's important that you highlight it that because when you get delivered, this doesn't mean the battles are and over. Everything's just gonna disappear and go away. Just means the bondage yes, is over. Exactly, and that's how I felt. I felt like I was released out of prison. And what's next? Mm. Well, I have to now take steps towards my full freedom and dominion. Discipleship. It, discipleship. And that's what I kind of mm. started to do step by step. And no, it was not easy. It was still hard, but I was able to do it because I mm. felt like 
now the odds are in my favor, mm -hmm. not against me. Mm -hmm. It's like the wind is blowing in yes. your back instead of in front of your in front of your face. And this is where the maturity comes in because one spouse can get delivered and then they come home and they think, oh great, now we're going to live heaven. Yeah. We're going to be happily ever after. But you're you still got to plant seeds. Yes. You still got to pull, pull out weeds. It's work. You yeah. st you're still going to have to Patience. put in some work toward this marriage and it, for a season it could get hard. Mm -hmm. Marriages are not hard, but it takes hard work to make marriages work. Especially when there's issues like that. Yeah, yeah. especially when you're new, you got to retrain yeah. your thoughts, retrain Absolutely, your attitudes, yeah. how you treat each other, yeah. how you don't provoke each other and all and of this stuff. And it's not only for the spouse that is getting delivered, that it's for the other spouse. Mm -hmm. The same thing, the other spouse that is trying to help the spouse that was bound, they need to also be able to grow and take those uh, steps of work to plant those seeds of love to continue to be patient. It, it's work on both ends. Mm -hmm. It's never just the person that is bound or was bound. So if you're watching right now and you need deliverance, I want to encourage you a few things. One of them is on vladschool.com. I have a deliverance prayer course. It's free. It's about 14 prayers that you can go one by one and receive the deliverance. I cannot tell you how many people have went through that and received that freedom. We have some videos also below where you can watch. One of them is how to spot a demon that has about 30 minutes of deliverance prayers or 20 minutes of deliverance prayers. You're welcome to come to Hungry Gen. Once a month we have a deliverance line and then once a month we pray for people on Zoom as well. Remember, not everything is a demon, but a lot of times demonic spirits are behind certain problems that we face. Marriage is supposed to be God's blessing on this earth in our life. If your marriage is more like made in hell, they're just fighting all the time, perhaps you've been fighting the wrong battle. Instead of fighting your spouse, begin to fight the snake. But also remember, you have responsibility. You have to pull weeds, bad habits, bad mannerisms, plant seeds, do things that the Scripture tells us, no matter how you feel, and deal with things in your own heart. If your spouse is resistant toward deliverance, but you're able to live together. Um, continue to pray for them. Don't try to shove deliverance on them, push deliverance on them. Let the Lord work on them. If your spouse is not only in need of deliverance, but your spouse is toxic, abusive, and threatens your very life and the life of your children, you need to distance yourself from that person physically so that this person can come to realization and can come back to themselves and be broken for the safety of your children and for the safety of your own life. We pray that God will bless you, your marriage, your future, and that He will take you from glory to glory and that your Christian happiness will be built on Jesus Christ and the freedom He freely offers to us. Thank you for watching. Let us know in the comments what did you learn today. As well as don't forget to hit like, share this and subscribe or follow us on this platform. God bless you.